Amen. Well, Christians and civil disobedience. Uh, Bill always gives me the hard topics, the ones that people probably send me the most emails about afterwards. How could you say that? How do you believe that? So I'm just going to give a caveat right now. I fully understand every time I get up to speak anywhere in the country that not everyone is going to agree with me and Jesus on everything. So that's perfectly fine. I believe, in, uh, I believe in giving everybody two sides of every issue just to be fair in this postmodern age. So I will always give you two sides, my side and the wrong side, and you can choose you know, which, one, uh, which one you want to come down on. And um, uh, I was reminded, I sent a, sent a funny little joke uh, this week about the, uh, the old uh, Texas. I'm from Texas, or spent about 15 years uh, serving at schools down there. Uh, so uh, this guy was uh, driving down I-35, and he uh, got pulled over for speeding. And when the officer came up to talk to him, he, the, he said, why were you going so fast? I said, well, I'm actually a, a juggler and a magician, and I'm headed to do a show down in Austin, and I'm late. And the, the trooper that pulled him over said, well... You know, that, that's uh, funny because I'm, I'm fascinated by juggling. He said, matter of fact, if you'll give me a quick juggling demonstration, I'll let you off. And the guy said, well, I'd love to, but I've already sent all of my equipment ahead. I have nothing here, so I don't have anything to juggle. The trooper said, wait here, let me see what I can find. He goes back to his patrol car, and all he can find is five uh, flares. So he comes back with these flares, and he uh, lights them, and he hands them to the guy and says, if you can juggle these and keep them going, I'll let you off. So the guy gets out and juggles them, no problem at all. Well, about that time, another good old Texas boy is driving by half drunk. Well, he sees this going on, and he pulls over beside the trooper's car, stops, gets out, comes up and looks at it very intently, and then sort of resigns himself, turns around, walks back, gets to the trooper's car, opens the back door, gets in the trooper's car, and closes the door. The trooper walks over to him and says, sir, what do you think you are doing. And the man says, well, officer, you may as well take me on to jail now because there's no way I can pass that sobriety test. So <laughs> when, it, you know, when it comes to our relationship with government, a lot of Christians have the kind of perspective that the government is our supreme authority. Just take me on to jail. You know, whatever you say goes, you're the boss. You know, Andy uh, talked about the relationship between uh, government and, and pulpits, which is a subject we've talked about on our radio show and something that's very near and dear to me. But in, in this presentation, I'm going to focus more on the relationship of the collision between government and Christians in general. Uh, it's coming. It's coming. And uh, I wonder if you're ready for it. You know, we've been so blessed to live in a culture for generations that is largely untouched by persecution and by uh, some of the things that uh, history has shown to be very unkind to Christians. Uh, but first of all, it's already happening, as I'm going to show you in just a moment in our country, but it's coming and will certainly get worse. I want to take you to Acts chapter 4 as kind of a, a springboard of sorts to kind of start this discussion that we're having in this session, the early days of the church, and uh, verse 18 will serve as a good starting point. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, let's look at some background. This is around 33 A.D. and tension was already beginning to build as the church was in its infancy. Having been formed on the day of Pentecost, as we read about in Acts chapter 2, they're now beginning to do what Jesus called them to do, share Christ with others and spread the gospel. Uh, there was certainly a sense of duty and calling among the apostles. But what they were finding is that Christ's mission conflicted with the government's mandate. So how are they to respond? And uh, as we take a look at this subject, we're going to look at a number of passages of Scripture. We're also going to look at some history as we discuss uh, the when, the why, and the how of civil disobedience. The when the why and the how of civil disobedience. Now, in my evening session tonight, I hope you'll be able to stick, uh, stick it out for the entire rest of the conference. We've got some great topics to cover. I'm going to be talking about the imminency of the rapture. And there's actually some uh, crossover between these two only in this sense. They both sort of bring up an urgency to the gospel. Because as we talk about civil disobedience and all of the signs of the times, we recognize that the time is short. And that's something that in our crowd... We certainly all appreciate, right? We understand Christ is coming back. It could be any moment in the twinkling of an eye. We understand that. And that creates urgency for the gospel. And uh, certainly the, the realization of that 
when we talk about the rapture later, becomes even more clear. Uh, but as we see these signs of the times, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to know how to, how to respond. So I want to start with the when. The when of civil disobedience. Stand firm against government when, first of all, it is tyrannical in its actions. We as believers should stand firm against the government when it's acting tyrannically. And we see this uh, in Acts chapter 4, for example, when they laid hands on them and put them in custody. What, what is tyranny? Well, tyranny is unrestrained exercise of power. It is unjustly severe government. A tyranny might be defined as despotic abuse of authority. And, and as Dr. Woods uh, said, and I so appreciate all of our speakers in this regard, we, we don't want this to be sort of a woe is me fatalistic conference. We want to give you some tools uh, to respond. And what do we do with this information? And how can we be about sharing Christ and fulfilling the Great Commission and living in this, this you know, shining like stars in this perverse generation, as, as Paul put it. So that's what we want to do. But unfortunately, along the way, we do have to have a dose of reality from time to time. And so I want to just briefly, if you'll indulge me, talk about tyranny in history. Because tyranny is nothing new. Tyranny is nothing new. You know, you, you, could, you, could, go, you could get my uh, presentation from the Denver uh, Stealing the Mind most recently, uh, where we talked about the illuminating the New World Order. And you could see how Satan has been striving to take over the world from the Garden of Eden. I mean, how many of you believe Satan would love to have this world as his own? And rule it and reign. And he's actually going to do that for a brief time when he indwells the Antichrist and rules for seven years. Uh, so one way or the other, we're headed toward a one world government. Uh, the Bible is very clear on that. Uh, we know ultimately Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Son of David, is going to come back. He's going to take the throne. He's going to rule in perfect peace and righteousness and justice over an unprecedented kingdom of righteousness, perfectly foretold in the Old Testament. And it's going to be a one world government where everyone will know of him from the least to the greatest. Uh, in the kingdom someday. But before we get there, we know we're going to be facing tyranny. And Satan has used many people along the way to try to accomplish this. Let's do a quick run through here, going back uh, through church history. Obviously, Caligula comes to mind, the insane tyrant. He was one of the most cruel, perverse, also extravagant, by the way, brutal emperors Rome ever knew in the very early days of the church. His motto was, let them hate so long as they fear. Uh, then uh, what about Genghis Khan, founder of the Mongol Empire, 13th century, the largest contiguous empire in history known for his wholesale slaughter, indiscriminate slaughter of his conquests. Henry VIII killed 70,000 people, including two of his wives, at least two. <laughs> We're not really sure. He was famous for setting up a huge spy network in his paranoia, trying to keep track of everyone. The Tsar of Russia, Ivan the Terrible, in the 16th century. Uh, he showed signs of cruelty and barbarism from childhood. He, he issued his first death sentence at age 13. He was, uh, he was known for, for the most painful kinds of death, including uh, boiling his victims to death and impaling them and, and burning them at the stake, which is a favorite of tyrants for centuries. What about the 18th century? Maximilian Robespierre from the French Revolution. He is really the de facto leader of that. He was a, a Jacobin and killed some 40,000 people. He set up as a pretext for his control and cruelty the Committee of Public Safety has a nice familiar ring to it. What about Joseph Stalin? In the 20th century, created the gulag system of forced prison camps and labor camps. Now you read most history books and listen to most you know, secular anthropologists, they'll tell you he's credited with, I'm not sure that's the right word, <laughs> killing 20 million people. But there's a fascinating study by R.J. Rommel out of the University of Hawaii um, that has shown that actually, you know, 20,000 isn't even close. But Stalin's responsible for some, I mean, 20 million, excuse me, 20 million we're talking. 
Stalin's responsible for really 43 million deaths. 43 million. You know, we, we wonder why sort of Hitler has become the archetypal, you know, tyrant, but Stalin killed four times as many people. 43 million. I mean, by comparison, uh, by the way, that means if you were alive during his rule of the Soviet Union, you had a 1 out of 222 chance of dying at the t- hand of that tyrant. By comparison, anyone at all had a 1 in 5,556 chance of dying during World War I. Uh, today, anyone has a 1 out of 357 chance of dying of cancer. And Americans alone today are, have about a 1 out of 4,167 chance of dying in a car accident. So what that means is if you were alive during Stalin's reign in Russia, you were 20 times more likely to die under his reign than you are of a car accident today. Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer, created the Gestapo, the secret police state, concentration camps, killed 11 million people, 6 million Jews, and many others, by the way. Augusto Pinochet, president of Chile, took over in a military coup d'etat on September 11th, 1973. Uh, He popularized a a, a nice uh, method of killing people called disappearing them. And that's why, again, a lot of uh, popular history books today uh, will say he's responsible for killing 3,000 people. But in recent history, we've uncovered some mass graves that make it more clear that he's really more like 10,000 people died under the hands of Pinochet. Pol Pot was the ruler of Cambodia. Uh, just the, the horror of, of what happened there is just beyond comprehension. You know, the, the killing fields. Uh, Three million of his own people, which is about a quarter of his population. And, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians were forced to dig their own mass graves that we call the killing fields. Kim Jong-il... Uh, not Kim, Kim Jong-un, who's there now, I think. I can't, I mean, it seems like he was gone for a while, but anyway, Kim Jong-il was there for 20 years. They called him the dear leader. Talk about irony. And he's, of course, famous for re-education camps, torture, forced labor, infanticide, forced abortions. So all this falls under the heading of, of democide. Now, why would, I, why would I trace through some of these famous tyrants or infamous tyrants, we might say? Well, because we need to understand that as long as Satan has been the prince of this world, democide has been a reality. And in referring back to that fascinating study uh, in the book Death by Government from R.J. Romola from the University of Hawaii, what we learn is that in the last century alone, governments have killed 262 million people. I mean, it's a fascinating book. I mean, you know, you know, detailed study and research. You know, if all of these bodies were laid head to toe, with the average height being five feet, they would circle the earth ten times. So tyranny is nothing new, and we as believers need to understand the order of relationships and the priority of relationships. And we need to break free from this mistaken notion that the government can do no wrong and that the government is the supreme authority. Now I'm going to come back to that in a moment because I know some of you, your wheels are already spinning and you're thinking of some Bible verses that you may be wondering about. And we'll come back to that. But it's nothing new. Go back to six centuries before Christ. Does the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ring a bell? Or Daniel in the lion's den? Nebuchadnezzar said, if you do not worship, you'll be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. In the first century, they were just repeating this same theme of tyranny. They they said to the early apostles, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in his name. Whenever they heard about the cause of Christ being advanced, They would get furious and develop more and greater plots. Early early Christians were beaten for their faith. They were seized. Now, again, this is nothing new. And, you know, so much of what we've 
uh, talked about in a couple of our sessions uh, so far. I, I, I love Sharam's uh, session and just the, sort of the coalescence of all of these signs of the times that are coming together, and uh, Dr. Woods as well, uh, the collision between pulpits and government. But so much of it isn't a look out, it's on the horizon. So much of it is look out, you're, you know, you're swimming in it. It's all around you. Uh, consider, for example, the story of Jason and Laura Hagan. On November 14, 2014, Homeschool Legal Defense Association, HSLDA, but on November 14, 2014, HSLDA filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against Chief Sheriff's Deputy David Glidden and Sheriff Darren White of the Sheriff's Department of Nottoway County, Missouri. Have you heard this story? The suit charges Glidden and White with unlawfully forcing their way into the home of HSLDA members Laura and Jason Hagan in a violation of their Fourth Amendment rights. A CPS caseworker had been inside the home several days earlier, watch this, to investigate a report of a messy house. Do you really think that see something, say something is for your own good? You know, we've become a nation of spies. So some, you know, nosy UPS worker or postal worker or, you know, cable repairman or somebody noticed a messy house and called CPS. So CPS comes over. And uh, they had returned for a follow-up visit. And when Jason and Laura declined to allow the CPS worker inside the home, she called the police. Glidden and White showed up and demanded to be allowed inside. Jason opened the door and told Glidden that he could not enter unless he had a court order. In other words, a warrant, a search warrant. And Glidden said he would enter anyway. As Jason turned to go back inside, Sheriff's Deputy Glidden sprayed him with pepper spray first at the back of his head and then directly in his face. Glidden also sprayed Laura, who fell to the floor. Glidden then turned to Jason, who was still standing, and shot him in the back with his taser. As Jason fell, Laura closed the front door. Glidden triggered the taser three more times through the closed door. Sheriff White joined Glidden on the front porch, and together they forced open the door and found Laura and Jason lying on the floor. So they sprayed Laura in the face a second time on the floor, while White sprayed Jason and tried to turn him over uh, onto his stomach. Laura shouted to the officers that Jason had just recently been taken to the emergency room for chest pains. And White nevertheless continued attempting to turn him over and sprayed him a third time when he couldn't. The officers then sprayed the Hagen's dog with a chemical agent and threatened to shoot it if it didn't stop barking. Finally, the officers handcuffed and arrested Laura and Jason and charged them with resisting arrest and child endangerment. All of this took place in front of the Hagen's three young children who were later taken to the emergency room to be evaluated for exposure to pepper spray. Well, at Jason and Laura's trial, the judge determined that White and Glidden had violated the Fourth Amendment when they forcibly entered the Hagen's home without a warrant. The ruling said, quote, the state has not offered sufficient, if indeed any, evidence of an exception that would justify a warrantless entry. The judge wrote in his ruling, and the case against Laura and Jason was dismissed. And so, understandably, they've now filed a civil rights lawsuit against those two uh, officers of the law. Now, that's, a, that's an anecdotal story. I get it. I, I have the greatest respect for police officers. I have friends that are police officers. Uh, I have students that are police officers. This isn't a you know, broad net that I'm casting here. But if you don't think that governmental authorities can become tyrants you've probably not flown recently and had the TSA put their hands in your pants, as I do about 250 days a year. So it can happen. So that's number one. When tyranny is in play, it's a no-brainer. You've got to stand firm. But then, broadly speaking, any time the government violates God's Word, you've got to stand firm. You know, in Acts chapter 4, remember they said, Speak to no man in this name. In other words, don't teach on the name of Jesus. You know, they commanded him, stop talking about the Lord. Well, how do you reconcile that as a believer with the command, go into all the world and preach the gospel? So who are you going to obey? That's the question. And that brings us to the why of civil disobedience. We should stand firm against government because... Our first priority is always God's Word. Our first priority is always God's Word. God's Word 
is the only standard for our beliefs, attitudes, and practices. You know, there's a common misconception based on bad exegesis and faulty interpretation of God's Word that, that Christians are bound to obey government and governmental authorities are universally appointed by God. I want you to think about that for a moment. I mean, were the Jews bound to get on the death trains? Were the Russians bound to go to their death camps? Are the Chinese bound to abort their children today? Of course not. You say, well, that's over there, you know. This is America. We're different. Well, here's a newsflash. The depravity of man extends to North America. <laughs> and, and American leaders are no less immune to, to the depravity of man than other leaders. And I think it was uh, Mike in our opening session today quoted 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men and imposters are growing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now that was written by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit in 67 A.D., Now, if things are getting worse and worse from 67 A.D. forward, and here we are in 2015, how bad must they be? You know, we haven't gotten better since the days of Genghis Khan and Ivan the Terrible and Henry VIII and Stalin and Hitler. Things aren't getting better. We're not seeing moral improvement in the depths of power-hungry control that that governments will go to. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm... I think America is the greatest country in the world. And it was founded by the pilgrims on biblical principles. And and it's, you know, we have some incredible God-fearing leaders in Washington, D.C. We've been to Washington, D.C. many times. It's kind of our home away from home. We have the subway system memorized there practically. Uh, I know there are some godly leaders in D.C. Uh, We we look for them every time we're there. We haven't seen any yet, but I know they're there. I, I just believe it. And um, so I'm not suggesting that, you know, it's a lost cause, but I think we need to understand the reality of the cesspool that is governmental authority under, you know, Luciferian control. Now, what we understand from Scripture is that we're not obligated to obey government first, but we're, obey, we're obligated to obey, obey God first, And Peter and John's response to this tyranny in the first century was whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, remember, they had been forbidden from speaking about Christ. I believe that their motivation here was twofold. It wasn't just because they had been with Christ a few months earlier and seen amazing things, most notably the resurrection. That wasn't the only thing, because some people might say, well, sure, they were motivated to do that, but it's been 2,000 years. You know, what's our compulsion? Well, I think it's the same as theirs, which their secondary compulsion was that it's the Word of God. Christ told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Christ commanded them to make disciples, and that hasn't changed. So one of the helpful paradigms to understand when thinking about this issue it all comes down to God's priority of relationships in Genesis. And it starts with man-God. The order of creation establishes it. You know, God-man, that's our first priority. My relationship with the Lord comes first. And your relationship with the Lord should come first too. Secondly, in the order of relationships, if you're married, is your relationship with your wife or your spouse. And, uh, and that's my second most important priority. You know, till death do us part. And uh, so, you know, a lot, of, a lot of couples get in trouble because they don't maintain those boundaries when it comes to their children. Because the third in the order of relationships and in the order of creation is the parent-child relationship. And if you don't have those clear boundaries, then, you know, you're going uh, to end up getting your priorities out of whack. And the children are going to control the marriage, right? And so, you know, we often, we, we learned this. And we make it a priority that, it, that, that, that our relationship is number one and our children come second. Now, I know that doesn't sit well with some of you, but I, I mean, I, I, don't take it up with me. Take it up with God. He's the one that created this order of relationships. But we'll tell our children all the time, you know, honey, I love you. You know, 
I love you more than anyone in the world except mommy. I, I love mommy most. And your children need to hear you say that, by the way. Dads. <laughs> they need to hear you say that. And, you know, the, the fact is, uh, you know, my children are going to be gone someday. I hope. <laughs> I had a, a neat call. I don't know if I should say this on tape. I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I had a neat call yesterday from a, a guy that was courting my 20-year-old, and he was a godly Christian man, 21 years old, and called. I didn't know. He called out of the blue. In fact, I found out last night that Bethany, my daughter, didn't know this either, but he called, emailed me first to say, could I set up a time to talk with you? I said, sure. Actually, when he, what he said in the email was, I'd like to set up a time to talk to with you and get your permission to date your daughter. She lives in Minnesota, involved in a church up there. And so I responded to the email by saying, thank you so much. It shows great maturity and respect. It's such an honor for you to reach out to me in this way. I'd be glad to talk to you. You know, FaceTime would work great because he suggested FaceTime so I could, you know, he could see me and I could see him. I said, in checking my calendar, it looks like I have some time open in 2017 or 2018. <laughs> so. Anyway, we finally, I let him off. I let him score him for a while, then I responded later. And, but we talked yesterday, and, um, you know, he... Uh, he needs to understand that, uh, you know, my relationship with my wife is number one. And someday, who knows where that relationship will lead. Lord, it's in the Lord's hands. But you know, someday my children are going to get married, Lord willing. Or they're going to move out. They're going to be on their own. And, you know, Wendy and I are going to be together till Jesus comes or the Lord takes one of us home. All right? And so the order of priorities. But you notice what comes forth in the Genesis account? What comes forth? Citizen government. So all I'm saying is, you know, we're not, we're not advocating, you know, some type of rebellion or revolution. I mean, government, you, you have to have order, and governments serve a purpose, and governments have been part of God's divine design for human culture forever. But you need to keep them in, keep them in perspective. And there are a lot of priorities that come before worshiping the government. So our first priority is always... God's word. You don't get to citizen government until Genesis, what, chapter 11 or so, right? Secondly, we stand firm against government because it always pleases God when we obey Him. It always pleases God when we obey Him. In the same context here of government tyranny in the first century, the apostles said, Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Peter's, or Paul's another great example. In his first epistle, he says in the book of Galatians, this is chronologically his first epistle, written just 14 years after he came to faith on the road to Damascus. And he is writing here, by the way, about the gospel. I mean, the most you know, passionate thing Paul has to say is about the purity and accuracy of the gospel in all of his writings, but it was most important that it comes first in, 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 in his first epistle. That's what he addressed right out of the chute. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which I preach to you, let him be anathema, he says. But then he says, knowing that this wasn't going to make him very popular, do I now seek to persuade men or God? Because if I was seeking to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He understood his priorities. Now the how. How do we engage in civil disobedience? Well, we stand firm against the government, first of all, by preaching the gospel at every opportunity. It isn't about a contest to win. It isn't about, you know, standing on principle. I mean, that's part of it. That's related to this. But it, there's a bigger cause at stake here. And that is that we have a job to do right now in this world. You know, if you understand the end times the way I do, the way I understand the Bible, you know, God's not through with Israel. Israel was the center stage, the, the, you know, the primary group, people group for uh, periods of years, but they've exited stage left for now during this intercalation in God's first advent and second advent. God has introduced the mystery of the church. We are now center stage. We are God's envoys. The church has a job to do. The church was a mystery. We have not replaced Israel. Well, not the new Israel. God's not through with Israel. Israel's coming back. We're going to talk about that tonight in my study on the rapture. Uh, God, someday the church is going to exit stage right or stage up, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, you know, kind of like Sandy Duncan and Peter Pan or something. Anyway, we're going to be out of here at the rapture when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And Israel's going to come back on the center stage. And when Israel's back on center stage, then, of course, we, we see the entire end times plan uh, 
unfold with the unveiling of the Antichrist and the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon and the, you know, all of those things. But right now, we're it. And our job is to preach the gospel. That's what matters most. There's a lot of other things that we do. To try to make a difference in this world. We be, we're encouraging, we're helpful, we're kind. But the gospel is what matters most. And uh, we're passionate about that at Not By Works. We, our goal is to advance the grace message you know, because it is urgent. There's an urgency about the gospel. I got saved when I was six years old because I grew up in a Bible teaching family and went to a Bible teaching church that preached the gospel. And they preached the gospel Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. And as a young child, they preached the gospel one Sunday evening service, um, which I know for some of you, you're wondering, what is that? Uh, well, Sunday evenings when people get together on Sunday nights and come to church for a worship service. Um, you know, they say Sunday, you know, Sunday evening services went out the night the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show. I think that's probably the beginning of the end of it. But anyway, the, 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 the preacher preached the gospel. And I came under conviction. And, and I got home that night and I said, I need to be saved. And as my dad came around to say my bedtime prayers, I knew one thing as a six-year-old. I knew I was a sinner and I did not want to go to hell. That's what I knew. And, and so I asked my dad about it. He reiterated the simple gospel, which is that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Do you realize you can state the gospel in ten words? Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And, and Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes it. The gospel. The gospel. And, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So when, when faith meets the gospel and the person responds and believes the gospel, they're saved. And that's what I did as a young six-year-old. And, uh, and that's, that's what matters most is the gospel. And, and we've got to get that right. And, you know, even though, you know, we're here today talking about a lot of fascinating subjects that are very near and dear to my heart, and I, and I love the dialogues and the conversations at the tables and, and just listening to these other great speakers, what matters most is the gospel. And if you're here today listening even right now, or listening by stream on the internet, and you've never trusted in Christ and Him alone for salvation, you need to do that today. We're not promised tomorrow. You may not wake up tomorrow. And there's an urgency to the gospel. And the gospel message is simple. You're a sinner who needs a Savior. And the penalty for sin is eternal separation from a holy God in a literal place of torment called hell. And the only hope, you can't be good enough, you can't work hard enough, you can't earn your way into God's favor. You, can't, you just can't self-improve. You know, See, a lot of people have come under the mistaken impression that salvation is a contract with God. You know? And it looks something like this. You sit down at the table, like here's the sinner, and there's God, I won't go over there because that'd be like being in the place of God. So just picture God over there, right? And so you sit down and you're saying, okay, God, here's the deal. I'm going to stop sinning. I'm going to promise to be good. I'm going to pledge my allegiance to you. I'm going to give everything to you, give it all up and over to you and promise to be everything and be all and do all for you and stop doing this and start doing this and be, do this better. And if I do all of that, will you save me? And then it's as if God then sticks his hand and says, you've got a deal. Let's shake on it. That's not salvation. Salvation is one direction. There, it is a gift and receiving exchange. But that's not a gift and receive. That's a contract. And salvation is not a contract between us and God. We don't get salvation by promising to do something for God. We get salvation by receiving something we can't get on our own. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. It is not by works of righteousness which we do, but according to his mercy he saved us. And if you think you can provide one ounce of anything that will impress a holy, perfect God by your promises or your pledges or your commitments or your this or your that, you've misunderstood grace. Because grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. John 1, 12 says, to, many, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. The gospel is a gift. There's one giver and one receiver in the gift equation. And our salvation is not about us giving something to God. That's discipleship. That's after you're saved. Now you've got a life to live in. How are you going to live it? What are you going to do for the Lord? How are you going to serve Him? But the salvation equation is God's the giver. 
we're the receiver. We're the receiver. So preach the gospel at every turn. And that's what you see in the book of Acts. They, they taught Christ and Him crucified again and again. And they didn't matter if they were in prison. Why do you think you know, Paul and Silas led the Philippian jailer to faith in Christ in Acts chapter 16? Exercise boldness. Exercise boldness in the face of persecution. You know, we, see, we read about this in Acts chapter 4, the boldness of Peter and John, because it's, it's contagious. You know, we, we need each other. We need to be reminded, you know, this is amazing. When you, see, when you look through church history and you see all the great martyrs for the faith, you know, they, they, they was usually in groups because it was so impressive to see people whose faith was strong enough to stand firm. And that leads to number three, standing firm no matter what is the cost. I mean, they faced beatings. They faced murderous plots, and yet they didn't equivocate because the government really wasn't, you know, the one in charge. There was a higher authority. There was a higher authority. And rejoice, rejoice knowing that we are suffering for His name. And they did rejoice. And I think there's going to come a day when we're going to Really understand 1 Peter 4.12 in an entirely new light. Don't think it's strange when we face trials, but rejoice. Rejoice. So here's the lessons to leave with. Number one, be thankful for the freedom we have in this country. But number two, be prepared for that to change. And number three, how will you respond when that happens? Ask yourself, how will you respond when that happens? My encouragement would be this. Be thankful for the freedom we have recognize it's changing, and be prepared to know what you're going to do about it. And we do that by staying rooted in the Word of God, which is the only standard for our beliefs, attitudes, and practices. Father, we thank you for uh, this time together today and for the encouragement that we get when we read historical portions of Scripture and see how the great men of faith have and the apostles have stood firm. And when we read the epistles and we see the same admonition is given to us today, we pray that uh, through the strength of your Holy Spirit, we too would have the courage to stand firm uh, when needed as we look to you as our only uh, priority. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.